I thought I had to know everything in advance. I thought I had to be the authority coming in. I thought I had to be, you know, I couldn't confess to not knowing something. I was reluctant to ask too many questions because I thought that would. What mistakes did you make directing your first episode of television? Mm. Yeah, that was uh, early in my career. I write a chapter about it in my book. It's the second chapter. I call it The School of Hard Knocks. Uh, I had wanted to be, and I grew up, you know, as a, a, I, I watched films in the 60s and 70s and kind of loved the independent cinema world and, uh, you know, really aspired. That's what I want to do. I want to make, I want to be an auteur. And uh, my first job was a feature film in 1984. Uh, Stephen King's Silver Bullet. <clears throat> not, I'm not a horror aficionado, but that was that was kind of often the the uh, the, the way in horror films to get get directing credits. And um, and after I did that, uh, you know, I was determined I don't want to do a feature. I don't want to do a horror film for next. I want my next film to reflect more my sensibility. Even though I'm I'm pleased that it now seems to have a kind of a cult following, and I enjoy people telling me, that, oh, that was a film I really liked, but I didn't want to do more horror films. And uh, so I, was, I went into you know, trying to find material I liked, went into what they call development hell on a couple of things. Uh, and I became, I, I got in my own way a lot. I became so, so uh, critical about anything, uh, anything that was offered that I, I didn't really, I wasn't very quick to attach to things. And because I wasn't terribly experienced, I wasn't offered the you know the great scripts. I was offered things that really required work, and uh, as I was developing material, which never wound up getting made, uh, I was offered some television shows, and I thought of television. Well, television. This was in the mid '80s, and uh, you know, at that time, the so-called golden age hadn't hit. Uh, the second one, of course, the original one was the live television age, but you know, and and so it really wasn't. I didn't take it very seriously as an artistic form, but I took, I said, okay, well, maybe I can take some of this work to just develop my chops as a director, you know. And uh, one of the first jobs I was offered was Miami Vice in its third season. And that was the cool show. And it's interesting too, because Miami Vice, which was spearheaded by Michael Mann, uh, was, was a bit snobby about who they hired as director. They only wanted to hire feature directors, which I qualified for because I had done a feature. But what I knew about directing then compared to what I know about directing through directing series television was like a thimble compared to an ocean. And, uh, but still I was hired for the job. And I came into it uh, with all kinds of ideas that really got in my way. One of which was I thought I had to know everything in advance. I thought I had to be the authority coming in. I thought I had to be, you know, I couldn't confess to not knowing something. I was reluctant to ask too many questions because I thought that would somehow uh, erode my authority. And I, and I, I even, I kidded myself. I lied to myself about things. And I, so I didn't, first of all, do as much prep as I needed to do. I didn't really immerse myself in the story. I thought, no, because I had a kind of romantic vision then too of what directing was. Oh, you have to be open creatively in the moment. Well, I've since found that to be most open in the moment, for me, I have to be fully prepared. And then I can be free enough to be open and trust the answers that will come for me. But then I didn't think that. So I, I started working on my advice. And that was like, uh, at that time, Don Johnson was known as the King of Miami. And uh, he, he was a director himself. And I was very new to film language. I didn't, you know, I didn't have security about mm, how do you, how do you, what my shot list, I wasn't ever sure like mm, screen direction and what shots do I need to cut the sequence well. And I'd kind of, you know, come up with an idea. But when I'd show up on the set, you know, Don Johnson would frequently say, uh, what, uh, no, how about we do this? And he'd talk to the camera and he'd start walking all over me essentially, which was humiliating. But what was, what was equally challenging was that his ideas were better, which I recognized. <laughs> so I constantly felt, mm, well, I'm, I'm okay. So I felt my, my, my confidence sapped and everything else. In addition, uh, I didn't know the way of the world in episodic television, and I didn't really understand the inner workings, the inner politics of it all. And I was shooting in Miami while the producers, the creative team was in Los Angeles, and I was communicating everything that I wanted to do to the, to the line producer in Miami, thinking that was equivalent to talking to the other producers. 
And when I shot a sequence, I won't go into the details of it, but I, I fixed something that was problematic for the budget. Uh, and the line producer said, yeah, great. And then when the producers saw dailies, they freaked out because I hadn't cleared it with them. And suddenly I became uh, a, a fair target because part of that show is everybody was trying to be cooler than everybody else. And uh, everybody was looking for a scapegoat if it wasn't like a super cool show. And so I became a lightning rod suddenly because I had, I had done something that hadn't been cleared. And then I made a neophyte's mistake. I, I didn't, hadn't read the script carefully enough and I misread uh, the tran a transfer of a body from the trunk of one car to the truck of another. And I, had, I, I missed it. I had it go the other way because it had made story sense in a different way than what the writer had imagined. But I wasn't even conscious that I was changing it. I just misread it. And I, to this day, I can't figure out why the script supervisor didn't tell me, hey, it's written this way. It's the other way. But anyway, uh, and as soon as that happened, in addition to not having shot uh, uh, the sequence as it had been written, uh, you know, it was, it was just a horrifically uh, challenging experience. And uh, there were a few other things that happened and, and I didn't know if I was ever gonna work again in television at, at that point. Uh, I was still more concerned with features, but it was, it was very painful and there were other things about it that were difficult. The episode turned out well, actually, and it, and it gave me confidence that, oh, I do know how to tell a story and despite no support and despite my own uh, Self judgments and self recriminations. I thought, you know, it works. The performances all were delivered. The story was told well, but it was hard to overcome that, those original impressions. And I didn't get another job for several months because, you know, that was my only reference and it wasn't a good one. And I, the next job I got was on another show at that period called Beauty and the Beast. And that also was a popular show. And uh, it's interesting, it was. Uh, for those of you, it's a, it's a retelling of, the story was uh, Ron Perlman played a lion-like mythological character who lived below the New York subways and that was the underworld. And Linda Hamilton played the beauty in the upper world and she would come, it was a, I think she was a news reporter and she would come down and they had this intense romance which was very romantic. And, uh, and the story I was given was an interesting one because it was about a young man who who uh, had a very intolerant father, single father, and he was miserable. The father could not credit the young boy's uh, interest in his own imagination. And uh, the, the showrunner of Beauty and the Beast knew that I was interested. I don't know how it was he knew that I was at that time uh, doing workshops and reading a lot of Robert Bly's work with men and, uh, and, and, and his partner, a mythologist, uh, Michael Mead, who still is doing great work up in Seattle. But I was very interested in initiation, male, young males' initiations, and this story seemed to be right up its alley. And uh, the showrunner actually called me and said, you're interested in this, let's, let's work on this because that's what this story is about. And I was very excited about it. And I started filming, oh, and I, and I learned from the experience with, with Vice that my problem was I hadn't been willing to admit what I didn't know. I hadn't immersed myself in the story enough so I could take full responsibility for every aspect of the storytelling and, and would develop a shot, uh, shot list and a way of seeing that I could defend and not just be a deer in the headlights when somebody had another idea. So I spent my entire prep overcoming my reluctance to admit what I didn't know asking if I could spend time on the sets after hours, on the weekends, you know, even if it made me look like someone who was, who was their first job. And I spent, and it was a real, it was a real epiphany for me because I, I, I took total responsibility for every moment being communicated. I lived on the sets, I absorbed them as if they were characters themselves. I acted out in my imagination all the scenes, I developed staging ideas because I wanted, I didn't want to come in again not knowing. And, and which starts with admitting what you don't know, admitting what questions need answering. That's what I hadn't done in the first job. And it became very exhilarating to me so that I emerged with a vision of how to tell the story and then I could enlist the help of all the collaborators. All they want to hear is what you want to do and what, what vision you're trying to hold. And then they bring their creativity and it was thrilling. And I started directing and within the first three or four, two or three days they really, the producers were over the moon. They, they called me and said, oh my God, these are the most beautiful dailies we've ever had. The performances are amazing. And on the, I think the fourth day, or they came to me and said, you know, you're, the showrunner came to me and said, you know, you're the director I most trust. Our next episode is the most important one. Can you do it? 
And I said, wow, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to, but it's a holiday. Let me check with my wife and we can work it out for our family. And I said, okay, good. And he says, great. So I had about three more days of filming. And about two days later, there was some shift that happened. It was very bizarre. Suddenly they weren't calling me. And and I, sh I shot a scene uh, for the ending of the show and the, the showrunner finally did call me and I could tell he was furious at me. And I said, what? He said, you didn't shoot a close-up of the father. And I said, well, we can shoot it tomorrow if you want it. But the reason I didn't is the story we had discussed doing in advance was that this was a story of an initiation. And that the story, not to get in too involved about it, but the boy travels to the underworld, finds an inner father who will bless him, who is embodied by Ron Perlman's beast. And it, it allows him to survive the intolerant other father and that, and that a key initiatory challenge is to develop containment. So that the scene the showrunner was asking me about is when he reemerges from the underworld and the father is there to greet him with, uh, with a battalion of firemen and police and Linda Hamilton's character is also there and the father embraces him who's never touched him the whole episode, he's just been angry at him. The key moment is the look between Linda Hamilton and the boy in the, while he's in the embrace of the father. Is he going to stay with containing what he knows? Because if he reveals the existence of the underworld, it will be the, its undoing. And so he looks at Linda Hamilton, she looks at him, and they understand in that moment that he's going to contain this. And so he's been blessed, he's, going to, he's on his way to manhood. And that was the story. To cut to a close-up of the father, I thought would muddy the issue. His feelings were not the appropriate thing. So I said, that's what I thought the story was. But if you want us to get this other moment, we'll get it tomorrow, which we did. And when I finished the episode, expecting to start the next day on the, on the, the, the following episode, I was told, oh, there's been some rethinking about this. And you're, you're going to report to the showrunner's office tomorrow. And I felt like I was being summoned to the principal's office. <laughs> but what happened was I, I showed up and you know, it reminded me of a scene, I don't know if any of your viewers saw the movie Network, but there was a famous scene when Peter Finch's anchorman character comes in to meet with uh, Ned Beatty's producer character in a conference room. And Ned Beatty just glowers over him and says, do you know what you're fucking with? That was, that was the feeling I had. That was, oh my God, this guy starts telling me and he's, he's, I remember his opening words. He says, I was seduced by your beautiful style and I miss that you have absolutely no capacity to elicit emotion. And I said, what? What's going on? I said, because that was the one thing I'd never been accused of. I'm good, very good with actors and getting in. And it's also, I was flattered because I didn't have a visual plan in the previous episode. And now he said I had a beautiful visual style. So that was great. And I, I said, what are you talking about? And something had shifted in him and he had developed, made a case against me. And what I came to understand is he had gotten cold feet about his, the whole thrust of the episode we had agreed upon going in because, you know, it's interesting, showrunners get to inhabit a very exalted position. You know, you really feel like you're on top of the world. You can even be a star yourself as a showrunner. And if your show gets canceled, it can be like going from the penthouse to the basement, boom, like that. And you could just join the throng of throngs of unemployed writers, you know. And I think he started to feel like, wait, we're not giving our audience the sentimentality, the romantic sentimentality we usually they tune in for. And and I said, what? Well, and I and I and I realized that, you know, I understood. This goes to an earlier question you asked me. It's like what what the audience's expectations were. I I understood that that was an element of the show, and I. I thought that actually we were uh, enhancing the uh, romance between Lynn Hamilton and Ron Perlman's characters by virtue of the fact that they were playing surrogate roles, surrogate parental roles with this young boy and they were bonding together as they were doing that. But the story I was handed was not a sentimental story. It was, a, I thought, a much more tough-minded one and a much more meaningful one. And I think he got cold feet. I think he got worried that I wasn't, so hence the need for a sentimental shot of the father at exactly the wrong time. But he had made a case against me and his producers who were just very slavish to him, you know, were, were supporting him and all that. And he said, you even undermined the key visual st uh, moments in the show, the, the, our visual uh, uh, highlights. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said that there was a visual uh, 
a trick they use on every episode when a, when you'd go into the underworld you'd walk into the subway tunnels and you'd enter what looked like a skylight but it was a super bright light and as soon as the character goes in they just would disappear and he said you didn't shoot that and I looked at the producer who was on set with me when I didn't shoot it and he didn't say a word I said well the reason we didn't shoot it is a light malfunctioned on the day and I knew we have to come back at expense great expense another time which we could certainly do but I said while we're here maybe there's a way around it maybe the boy could approach the light could be photographed it's just when someone went into it they wouldn't disappear so maybe the boy could be moving towards it and then we could cut to Linda Hamilton watching him disappear as the audience would assume he had and turn away I said if it doesn't work fine we have to come back we'd have to come back anyway but if it does work we have it but he was convinced I was actively trying to sabotage him so it was a crazy crazy experience and now I'd had two terrible experiences <laughs> in terms of future references and I thought well, am I ever going to work again and I did finally of course get another job several months later and ironically it was with a showrunner who had worked on Beauty and the Beast and didn't care at all about what had been said because he had been on staff there and had seen these exact kinds of accusations leveled routinely at other people himself included you're undermining the show or whatever so he says I don't I don't care about any of that and on this show uh, it was, it was it was interesting I started working on it I, I applied the same lessons I'd learned from the need to really prep and get fully immersed I started shooting and on the second or third day I got a phone message and I'm listening and it says oh it was producer director we love your dailies the performances are great we just couldn't be happier and I remember I was in San Francisco I was walking to the set and I just remember just dropping the phone Think, boy am I glad I had that experience on Beauty and the Beast so, so I know not to take any of that seriously and I stopped myself thinking wow is that really what I feel I'm glad for having gone through that horrible experience and I realized I was because it had acquainted me with uh, so much about the nature of these shows and what the political interactions are and sensitizing me to that I mean if if they hadn't liked the show I would have uh, what I was doing I would certainly want to hear about it and I would try to you know accommodate them but I knew that I wasn't going to be so dependent anymore on you know someone else's opinion I'm not and I'm not going to necessarily you know assume I'm at fault or go into a dark hole if, if, if a choice I've made isn't agreed with so that was that was big but what was most important what I realized was that the real gift of Beauty and the Beast was the experience I had before it ever blew apart when I knew to just go on the set spent which I do to this day just immerse myself in the story to find out what I care about find out what might need to be changed for me to care about it more find out in advance what walls might need to be made wild meaning you could take it out when you're shooting away from it but put it back in when you're shooting towards it giving you a better frame all of those things I learned to just to and to, to just to be fully uh, take full responsibility for the storytelling that was the real gift of Beauty and the Beast and I've, I've made use of those gifts I think for the rest of my career and so do you think that it's more detrimental to the set to have a director who yells mm -hmm. and is somewhat of a bully or a director that uh, doesn't own their authority and is and as yeah, you said earlier need, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, set demeanor is 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 a is a is a, is a real issue uh, and one of the uh, requirements or one of the realities of being a director is that you're the one in command and you can either accept the responsibilities that come with that accept take ownership of that role or not now there's all kinds of ways to take ownership of that there's all kinds of ways to to have command and to demonstrate command it does not mean you have to be commanding I think you know as I've thought about it and I wrote a chapter called inner states in my book that addresses this among a few other things uh, I think those who have command are those who the, the crew and the cast they have to feel that within you there is a there there that you're taking responsibility for the storytelling and that uh, and that the buck stops with you now I think the best leaders are those who are willing to acknowledge what they don't yet know and are, are and are interested in collaborating and are interested in getting the best from the people around them because you know there are so many people that have expertise that I as the director don't have you know the director of photography knows far more about about light sensitivity and lensing and all that than I do I have ideas and I'll make suggestions 
but I, I, I cut off my nose to spite my face if I insist, you know, if, I don't, if I'm not interested at least in hearing, you know, another point of view. Same with, same with production designers and, and prop people and, 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 and uh, you know, wardrobe and hair, all these people, what I try to do is, is carry a vision for what story, communicate a vision for what story I'm telling, where I think the emotional reality lies. Where, what subjective state I'm hoping to create for individual scenes. Communicate that without telling necessarily how to achieve that. And so someone, and then, then you're enlisting the creativity of everybody to come up with ways that I might never have thought about. You know, uh, so, so how to get the best from your collaborators is I think the mark of a, uh, getting the best from your collaborators I think is the mark of a good leader. You know, we all have insecurities. We all have our personalities we bring into it. One of the, one of the things that, uh, you know, is a constant learning for me, and I, you know, I, earlier in my career it was not something I could always hold in mind, is how much people project onto you as the director. You know, you're the authority figure. Now, you know, uh, you, you probably experience yourself as the flawed human being that we all are, but when you're in a position of authority, other people are looking to you. And, and as the director, you know, you have the great, great power to influence their own sense of job security or even self-worth. You know, if they project, who knows what they're projecting on you. So it's important to accept that role and to be, and to be, I would say, benign. That's not to say, I mean, that, that's also means sometimes you have to set boundaries. You have to you hold people accountable. It doesn't mean you're always saying yes to everything or it's a love fest. You know, sometimes people don't measure up and don't, don't take responsibility for their own areas they need to take responsibility for. And I think as a leader, you need to make that clear that you expect better. But, you know, when you are um, uh, abrupt and, uh, uh, you know, dictatorial, I, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make me want to cooperate with that person. And I assume that's how others are going to react. And I think it also betrays an insecurity that people at a deeper level understand. So which also makes people uneasy, regardless of how they're being treated personally, they don't feel they're in good hands. They don't feel actors, for example, may not feel the story is going to get told well, because this person is insecure and is just not listening to me, won't even hear it. They're too rigid. So, uh, there's that problem, and then there's also the problem when you know when you, you when a director doesn't take responsibility, you can always feel that when you walk on the set because there's a kind of vacuum there. You know, no one really knows who's going to make the decision, and that leads to an enervation and a kind of you know, you don't get your, the best from your uh, collaborators. And I think there's a baseball metaphor I like, which is, you know, the the pitchers with the best control are the ones for whom the defense plays better because they know, like for example, if a batter comes up, you know, I don't know if many, any, many of you are baseball fans, but like on a diamond, if you pitch someone, if a right-handed hitter is up and you pitch on the outside, the likelihood is they're gonna hit the ball more to the right side. They're not gonna be able to get around. So if the infielders see that the catcher is signaling for the ball to come to the outside and they know they can count on their pitcher to hit that spot, they'll gravitate more to that side and be in better position to field it. If the pitcher's wild and throw it anywhere, they don't know what to do, you know. Uh, so, you know, taking responsibility makes everybody feel, feel, you know, I think more willing to contribute themselves so long as the one taking responsibility is respectful and interested in what they, the others can bring. You mentioned the director's role and being benign. I think you used some example of a, a Francois Truffaut yeah. film where there was a hearing aid yeah, yeah, as yeah. it related yeah, to yeah. Well, a director's role. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that's that's not often spoken about is, uh, and I haven't read a lot of the literature that's been written about directing, but the, the, that I, the, the, the ones, that, the books that I have seen, and, and also just the discussion generally about directing and and when I talk to young directors and the people, no one seems particularly interested or aware necessarily of the wide range of emotional challenges that you face as a director. The stresses, the bombardment with questions, the need to come up with answers, you know, all the insecurities and, and different moods, the impatience you can get when something isn't happening fast enough or when, it, when an actor isn't understanding something or, you know, it's like it can, it can, creates such a wide variety of emotional states 
that one of the really important qualities to develop is, is I, I think of it as mindfulness, is, willing, is containment, is being willing to acknowledge what's happening within you and still keep your, you know, see the forest for the trees and keep your eyes on the prize and maybe a few more cliches I could throw in. But, you know, to, uh, to so, so that there are these, these stressors as a director. You know, uh, is this good? Am I getting this? Oh my God, it's that time. We are only on this three more scenes. The most important scene is at the end of the day and I'm gonna have to rush it because I had all these things you have to, you're constant prioritizing and always trying to think. And my way through, by the way, is to always emphasize story, that that's the thing I have to focus on. What's the story point? What's, you know, how, if I have to simplify something, I don't want to simplify, I don't want to lose a story point. I might sac have to sacrifice a beautiful shot that was time consuming, but getting a beautiful shot and missing the story is not even a consideration. You know, you, you've got to, I, for me anyway, you've got to keep telling the story. And uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the states that I, I mentioned in my book that you cite is that, you know, Francois Truffaut, brilliant filmmaker, one, uh, maybe my very favorite film director, maybe my very favorite film is The 400 Blows. A Buddha Sufla, which he made in 1959, which I didn't see when it came out, but I saw it a little after, and it's a beautiful film, autobiographical film. He made an, another wonderful film, several, but one in particular called La Nuit Americaine, which was translated as Day for Night. And that's, you know, the term that, a film term, when you, you know, shoot uh, um, a night sequence in the middle of the day by stopping down the camera. A lot of Westerns used to do that. So when you see a Western and it's like, it's night, but you're seeing everything across the plane and everybody, you know, well, you didn't, they didn't like that whole thing. What they did is they, they limited the exposure to the film so that it would just look darker. Uh, so anyway, that was, that's a film term, but in Day for Night, he played, he played a director of a film coming together. It's a wonderful film. And one of the things I love about it too, is it, it really does capture the feeling of what it can be like even on series television when you when you worked for a period of time and you've worked with various different crews and then you move around and crews spread out and the makeup person from this show is winds up oh on this new show oh I know you and and the you know the key grip is some oh yeah I remember we worked on so this show is great it showed everybody kind of coming together and this whole world getting created to create this film and Truffaut played the director and he was deal, he, in this little sly twist, I thought, you know, everybody's coming to him, they're producing, we don't have enough money. And he's saying, okay, we'll deal with that. And the actor's saying, and I just got out of the psychiatric ward and I have to, and his, you know, we have to deal with that. And okay, I'm dealing with that. And then the star, and it's like all, and everybody's coming in with questions. And he gave his character a hearing aid so that he could just simply at some times just say, I can't hear you. <laughs> and it's like, and I thought that was really a great little twist because it's like, I, I thought it just spoke to a fantasy you know, many directors have is it would be nice sometimes to just tune it all out. Just give me a break. Let me just <laughs> let me just chill for a minute. But you know, the reality is, the director is the one person who can't be missing in action. 